when your keto diet is not working, when you're not seeing results like you think you should, what you should do to change up your eating throughout your cycle and even as you approach menopause, that is what we are going to be talking about today with my very special guest, Leanne Vogel. Let me tell you a little bit about her first, and then I'll turn the mic over to her. So I personally have been listening to Leanne's podcast, the Keto Diet Podcast, for ever. And I just found out it is the longest running keto podcast ever. So that is just so completely badass. I'm so blessed to have her on. So Leanne, she's a holistic nutritionist. If you listen to this on the podcast, you'll hear her full intro, but I want to give you guys listening right now a little blurb. She is a holistic nutritionist. She's the best-selling author of The Keto Diet and The Keto Diet Cookbook and Keto for Women. She's the founder of healthfulpursuit.com. She is the creative behind Happy Keto Bonnie. She's been in this health and wellness space since 2007 doing meal plans, helping women do what they need to do for their body, how to do proper keto. She has all kinds of free videos, podcasts, recipes, keto-friendly resources on her blog that, of course, we will post everything in the show notes, and we're going to talk a little bit more about her programs at the end. So Leanne, thank you so much for your time and for coming on today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Dr. Amy. I'm just so thrilled to be here. I've been listening to you for so long, just so long, and it's such a thrill to have you on. So I love your knowledge. You know, I mean, we've talked already. I've been on your podcast. We, I love keto. I do. I love keto for hypothyroidism. As we discussed, I see a lot of insulin resistance with hypothyroidism, and of course, we see a lot of, I, I see a ton of hormone issues in my female patients. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you, give me your story of how you came into the keto space, because I know you had thyroid issues as well as hormone imbalance. So let's talk about that, and then we'll move it into thyroid hormones and what to do when keto is not working. Yeah, completely. So I was vegan before I started keto, and I really thought I had a pretty good handle on my health. However, I hadn't had my period in eight years. I had amenorrhea. I had gone to many, 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 many doctors, and all of them said, do you want to get pregnant? And I'm like, nope. And they're like, who cares? Um, so I really couldn't find support. And uh, a friend of mine had gone keto. I didn't know what this word was. I clicked on the hashtag keto on Instagram. And and it blew up my mind with, what do you mean people are eating Slim Jims and Diet Cokes? And, and <laughs> what, what are they doing? What is this? Um, and I, I went back through my notes uh, from school and it just said, keto equals dangerous, do not do. And so I, I really never learned about what a keto was or how to do the keto thing. Um, so I just delved deep into just about anything I could find. In 2014, there wasn't a lot of information. Um, so it was a lot, you know, there was one book on using the ketogenic diet nutritionally. Um, so I read that book and I just got started uh, doing all the things. And I realized very quickly that there's a right and a wrong way for keto specifically for women. So I, you know, moved stuff around and adjusted stuff. And I was working with um, small groups at that point, 100 people per group, 100 women per group, trying to mm -hmm. learn from them. And how's this working for you? What's working? What's not? And after nine months, I ended up getting my period back. And that was in 2015. And since then, you know, it's 2021. Now I've had my cycle the whole time. And now I just have been helping women figure out what keto is best for them, if keto is best for them and how to adjust. Um, I think a lot of the times we think of, you know, calories and adjusting our macros, but there's a lot more to the ketogenic diet um, because it is a metabolic state. It's so deep. It's so rich um, and it helped me get my period back. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Woo. That's awesome. Now, how did the, how did the thyroid um, hypothyroidism work into that? Yeah. So, um, I thought at the time it was definitely improved by mm -hmm. eating a ketogenic diet, just helping my gut and not eating a ton of grains and vegan processed gunk that I used to eat. Yeah. Um, so it definitely helped in that regard, but up until about a year ago, you know, I was up to 90 milligrams of desiccated thyroid. It really wasn't improving. I'd done quote unquote everything right. And so again, I went to the research and I'm like, there has to be some reason why I can't get my thyroid better. Uh, I tested positive for heavy metals, mm -hmm. mold, 
and parasites. And through uh, my first round of parasite killing, my TSH has been absolutely beautiful. My free T3 is 0.8 higher. And so I yeah. think I'm definitely onto something. I'm not fully there, but the ketogenic diet helped bridge that gap because it was a lot worse. I was on a hundred and uh, I was on 90 milligrams twice a day when I got started with the ketogenic diet and I was able to get down to 90 milligrams once a day. So that was huge wow. for me and feeling, you know, it's not just about the numbers with thyroid, as you know, it's how are you feeling? Yeah. And a lot of people, their quote unquote numbers look fine, but they're still experiencing hypothyroid symptoms, thyroid symptoms overall. And so for me, it was a reduction in my symptoms and being able to get lower in my medication. So it definitely helped. Was it the full meal deal? No, I've had to get deeper for myself, um, but it, it made a huge difference for sure. Wow, that is crazy. You cut your thyroid medication dose in half, in half. Yes. So if you think about, and that's just through the keto diet, that isn't even getting into the heavy metal detox and the mold detox yet. That's just mm -hmm. through eating properly. So, you know, a message for the people that are on maybe just a little bit of med. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of my patients will say, I want to come off the medication. I want to come off the medication. It's like, oh yeah, well, maybe, I don't know. We'll see when we support all the nutrients and all that. But the diet is the uh, very, very key component, if not the key component, because if you're pumping in a bunch of garbage and carbs, and I'm sure you see this in the women that you work with, your insulin is going to be high. Nothing is going to get better. Oh, completely. If it, I think a lot of people think it's just the one thing, like if I can figure out the one thing, my body will be better and I'll be healthy and I'll lose the weight. And I think nutrition makes up a huge portion of that. Like I would say at least 70%. If you can get the food figured out, that's a major win. Will it take you all the way there? Maybe not, right. but 70% is a big chunk. Movement is part of that. And then we get into more of the chronic things like the heavy metal, parasites, mold, you know, the stuff that takes a little bit more work um, to get to more of the illnesses and, and infections and things. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, like if you can get a good handle on your nutrition, thyroid, you know, it's super important for me specifically, not so much now. And maybe this is how I got a parasite. But I used I had a bunch of sushi that helped <laughs> um, making sure that I had um, seaweed and Brazil nuts and just a balanced overall diet. And we'll get into this, I think a little bit later is the classic ketogenic protocol did not work for me. And it actually mm. made me more sick. So even understanding that check engine light that's going off, if you're eating, a, you're following a nutrition protocol that's supposed to make you feel better and you actually feel a lot worse, sometimes it could be die off and things like that. And you need to chat with your practitioner or, you know, do a bunch of Googling to figure it out. But generally speaking, you should start to feel better. And if you don't specifically on the ketogenic diet, then you need to adjust things. And that's a big mistake that I made over and over and over and over and over again until I was like, oh, wait, I need more carbohydrates and a couple of other key things. So <laughs> yeah, I'm big into personalizing keto. Something that you said earlier um, when you were first talking is that when you're working with women, you tell them if the ketogenic diet is right for them. And I love that because then that, that I mean, you're not pushing, you're not saying everybody should go on the ketogenic diet because you've seen things that have worked for you and what hasn't worked for you and, and with the women that you work with as well. So I love that because I think you get easily pigeonholed. I know I love the ketogenic diet. I'm talking about it all the time. So people automatically think if they're going to come to see me, I'm putting them on a keto diet. No, we're going to put you on a personalized diet. But yeah, I mean, chances are it's going to be low in carbs if you have a thyroid problem because of that insulin resistance component. So what did you see that doesn't work or that needs tweaked and kind of talk about your journey and what you found for yourself and then what other people can do when it's not working and when they are feeling worse. Yeah. So I like to kind of break it up into two pieces. One is the levers or levers, depending on where you're located. Um, so the levers allow you to determine um, these are your calories, your carbohydrates, your proteins, and your fats. So these are like the big things that you're shifting and moving to um, make a protocol that's best for you. So to, in order to understand the levers, we need to understand that keto is a metabolic state. 
It doesn't mean that you have to have 70% fat and 20% protein and 10% carbs. People could get into um, a ketogenic state with 50% fat. Um, if they're registering even just a bit of ketones, that's generally enough. Another thing we have to be mindful of is can they generate ketones? What's, what's the state of your liver? What's happening there? If you're eating a ketogenic diet and you're hitting the wall and you're like, why can I only generate 0.2 ketones? I'm doing everything right. I'm eating all the fat. What's happening here? We need to look at the liver and we're going to get to that in a second when we talk about tweaks. But these levers are these big things, the calories, the carbs, the proteins, the fats. Where is all of this and how do you adjust? And for me, my carbohydrates at 10% was just not enough. Like 20 yeah. to 40 grams of total carbohydrates was not enough. What ended up happening is... Um, very quickly, I couldn't sleep. I could stay up. I watched all of Battlestar Galactica in three days. I just could not sleep. Um, you know, I was so wired, like just, do you want to go do something at two o'clock in the morning, just ready to go? That's not a normal reaction. No. Um my glucose started getting sometimes in those situations, our cortisol can stimulate our glucose, and then we can actually have higher blood glucose numbers. Mm -hmm. For me, my glucose started getting really low, like super uh, low, yep. I would get faint and dizzy. And I just think like, hey, I'm doing this right. I'm burning up glucose. This is how or burning up glycogen. This is how it's supposed to feel. No, no. And I see that very often with women forcing themselves to fast and kind of, Ugh. if keto is this protocol, then if I just make it better by eating more fat, less protein, less food overall, I fast every day, then that'll be even better, right? And so they're trying to manipulate these levers too much that they're not getting the proper support they need. So that is like the big ticket items that everyone talks about. And then there are the tweaks. And this is the bio individuality piece where it's, are you sensitive to sweeteners? That's a big one. A big sweeteners, one. dairy, um, can you have large volume meals? You know, a lot of us will look at the one meal a day and be like, hey, I could do that. Only eating one meal a day. That's fantastic. And they pound 1500 calories in one sitting. That might not work for your bio individuality. And if you're a woman, it's probably not going to work that well. Right. Um, Food sensitivities, uh, sleep, we talked about a little bit, and this is a good marker. If you're not sleeping well, there's an issue. Um, food quality, paying attention to that food quality, what your body needs might be different than what my body needs. With my kidneys and where they're at and detoxification and everything that I'm going through right now with a parasite mold situation, I can't have any food that's not organic. I react really poorly right now. Um, and so I know that right now I really have to pay attention to my food quality. Um, your movement and all that kind of makes up these tweaks beyond the big levers. Because I think oftentimes when our eating style isn't working for us and we're like, I'm not seeing success, my thyroid's still a mess, it must be my calories or it must be my carbohydrates. And we hear that a lot. What we don't hear about is our bioindividuality. What's going on beyond the big levers? What's happening in the intricate pieces you know, for, for me, it was parasites <laughs> was the big ticket item that made a big difference. My thyroid numbers, um, improving a little bit uh, for you. It might be that you're doing high intensity interval training and you can't like it, it <laughs> yeah. affects your adrenals. It tanks your thyroid. Maybe for you, it's going for walks outside and listening to your favorite music. And so really understanding that there's so much more than just are you making sure that you're eating 50 grams of carbohydrates or less? Um, yeah. So that's kind of how I separate them out into little boxes so that you can understand what you're working with. I um, mean, I think the levers are, are very um, popular and that's all we kind of talk about, but there's the bio individuality piece that goes far beyond that. Oh my gosh. That's beautiful. I love that you said that. I want to post this everywhere because even my, <laughs> honestly, even my patients, they will get into, they will get sucked into because a lot of them are type A's, right? Mm -hmm. They're that the driven type A personality where, and I get it. I've been there when I first started intermittent fasting. It was like, today I am going to intermittent fast for 18 hours, no matter what. And I wake up and I'm hungry and I'm miserable and I'm miserable all day. And I'm not realizing that I'm jacking up my cortisol levels, which is just sending me back anyway. So that intermittent fast benefit 
just went out the window because I was so hell bent on doing what I had set in my mind to do for that day. And I think the same goes for, like you said, with the ketogenic diet, the 70%, got to get those 70% in, got to keep those carbs under 20 or under 50 or whatever marker they choose to, to make as their cutoff or total or, or net and all of that. It just gets to be a number that they get hyper-focused on. And hey, I'm glad that number isn't calories. But like you said, then what if you end up dropping your calories too low because you're too restrictive and you just go too far down that rabbit hole? Yeah. And I mean, even with the calories piece, it kind of happens naturally as you're fasting, where if you're doing intermittent fasting every single day, and I mean, intermittent fasting shouldn't be practiced every single every day. No. And when I first got started with keto, I thought that that's what you did. And so every single day was an eight out six to eight hour eating window. And so just naturally, I was eating much, much, much less and less and less and less and less and less. And you do that enough, depending on your bio individuality. And you, I mean, it's not going to be good. And I just thought that the, you know, the wooziness when I stood up was just because I was burning ketones or making ketones. And it was so hard for me. And my body just needed time. No, it's because my electrolytes were low. I needed some carbohydrates. I needed more water. I needed, you know, those, those basic things, more food. Um, and so I think the fasting piece is like an excuse for not eating enough. And that's how people are manipulating their calories on a ketogenic diet saying, but I'm eating keto, everything's fine. I just can't eat more. Um, and you know, it depends if you have insulin resistance, Mm -hmm. Your triglycerides are high. Your doctor is saying you have prediabetes. That's going to be a very different protocol than somebody who just isn't feeling well. Maybe they need to lose 20 pounds. Um, they have a history of disordered eating. They have a history of not eating enough, a history of chronic dieting. Their protocol is going to look very different. And I think today we see a lot of keto content geared toward pre-diabetes and that protocol is going to be very different than somebody who's not necessarily pre-diabetic, but has other chronic things like thyroid, um, adrenal, you know, adrenal imbalances, thy or rather hormone imbalances, um, their protocol is going to look different and has to look different. Oh, definitely. I mean, with the, the pre-diabetes diabetic group, their protocol is usually under 20 grams of carbs. Now, yeah, I, 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 I do keto, but I do not go that low unless I'm in a, in a weird state where maybe I'm gaining something's off in my body and I want to kind of, you know, just drop it down for a couple of days, go super low and then come back to my normal level. But where do you normally say to people, I know there is no hard and fast rule, but what is your in general for women cut off for carbohydrates? Where do you like them to see, see them at and below? Yeah. So it kind of depends. It's a complicated answer to a simple question, yeah. <laughs> um, but it depends if you're a menopausal woman, I'm going to say probably anywhere between like, I'm going to say probably around 40 grams of net carbohydrates. Okay. Um, maybe 30 grams of net carbohydrates, depending on what's going on. So yeah, it's like mostly 40, sometimes 30 mm -hmm. around there for menopausal women. Now, if you're a woman who's still cycling, who still has her cycle or should have her cycle, if you're experiencing menorrhea, this information applies to you too. Then it depends on what point you're at in your cycle as to how much carbohydrates you could or should have. Um, so if you're at the beginning part of your cycle, um, you know, between days one and 10 ish, I usually like to see that number pretty low. Like if you're trying to do a, a ketogenic diet and, um, we're working on supporting your hormones, I like to see that number between 20 and 30 depending. And then for, almost the rest of your cycle, I like to see that number 40 to 60, maybe even 80, depending. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not a huge proponent of just set your set your macros, set those levers and just forget about it. And this is the plan that we're on. We have to understand that just as our hormones are cycling and we need different things at different times of our cycle, you might notice that with your activity where at the beginning of your cycle, you have a lot more um, ability for endurance. Whereas at the end of your cycle, right before bleed, you're like, 
there's no way I'm going to run yeah. anywhere. <laughs> That's not happening. Right. Same goes with your carbohydrates. I mean, we notice that. I know for myself leading up to close to my period, I'm like, give me a sweet potato right now. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, day three or four when I'm ending bleed, all I want is steak. And so understanding that our carbohydrates and our overall macros can be adjusted um, throughout our cycle kind of sets us up for success instead of like day 26. I'm like, I just want a sweet potato. I can't have a sweet potato. I can only have 20 grams of carbs. There's no sweet potato. I can't have a sweet potato. And then you go off plan until day five of your cycle and you feel like a total loser for quote unquote, screwing up your plan. Um, right. So it just kind of I like to set people up with that expectation as opposed to here you go 40 grams of carbs. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay here. That's it. That's all you get. Stay. Sorry. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter. And that's tied into that whole intermittent fasting thing, right? So you might have it set that day where, okay, you know, mm -hmm. and those, for those of you listening, day one of your cycle is the first day that you bleed. So that's what we count as day one. So when we're talking about going low, it, just like Leanne said, if it's, if the goal is 30 grams because you are in that beginning part of your cycle and you go to 80 or you go to a hundred because you really wanted a sweet potato and a few more keto chocolate chip cookies made with almond flour. I don't know. Uh, but it, it's okay. You have to give yourself some grace there because you can always get back in. And especially once they are fat adapted or adapted to eating this way, it's kind of easy to just spring back in, right? Yeah, it's completely true. Like what we're trying to do, I mean, what we should be trying to do on a ketogenic diet is become more metabolically flexible. After a couple of weeks, depending on how long you've been eating a ton of carbohydrates, what your eating style was before. I mean, ideally, we want you to be mildly fat adapted around six weeks, give or take a couple of weeks, depending on where you're coming from. But generally speaking, if you've already known you had a thyroid condition, you already feel like you're eating pretty good. You just don't know what's wrong. You should be able to become adapted in about six weeks because you have a pretty good base of support. If you're coming from a standard American diet where you were eating McDonald's like yesterday, you know, it's going to take you a little bit more time. But I think we need to understand that once we're fat adapted, adding in those specific nutrients, even like if you look mm -hmm. at estrogen support, uh, studies show that um, items like quercetin and isoflavonoids and zinc can support estrogen. Mm -hmm. So if we know that your estrogen needs to be a little bit higher days, um, like 10 to 14 around that in your cycle, that's after your bleed. So days around 10, 14, 11 to 14, incorporating foods that have those uh, components like dates or dried apricots or white beans or yams. I mean, you'd think, how is that keto? That's not even keto. But if we can incorporate those at those times of your cycle, it can actually help your hormones, help your overall metabolism. Um, so yeah, once you're fat adapted, you can play a little bit and see like, how much can I get away with? Not so much so I can go to a and w and get a root beer float mm -hmm. but how can i time this out properly so maybe i can incorporate more carrots at this time of my cycle or right. or some apple at this time of my cycle to actually support my body with phytoestrogens and nutrients that have been shown to support estrogen for example and you can do the same thing with progesterone um, so you can kind of cycle that in uh, once you are fat adapted to get better results overall for your health yeah. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. I, I, you made so many women happy saying <laughs> the words apple and dates and sweet potato and beans. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And, and you know, I, and I'm sure I know your answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I've been eating this way for so long that it was funny just this past weekend, I stopped and I thought back on my last week and last week was just a higher carb week. It just was. And I kind of, I, I never add up my macros anymore. I just don't. I go by how I feel. I don't test anymore. I used to test my glucose and ketones all the time. I don't test. I can just tell when I'm in ketosis or not. And I thought back on last week and I just kind of added up a couple of days. I was like, wow, I think I hit like 90 or 100 a few days in a row, but yet still stayed in ketosis because like I said, I, I know when I'm out, right? So are you the same way? You can tell when you are in ketosis, in that metabolic state of ketosis, not necessarily doing a keto diet, quote unquote, but you are in that metabolic state of ketosis. 
versus maybe not after, I don't know, a long holiday. Yes, completely. Yes, completely. I I stopped personally tracking like my actual macros and using a calculator, you know, using my phone and typing in all the things that I was eating probably about three years ago. Um, Once a month, if I'm feeling like it was an odd month, or I have some PMS issues, and like what went on there, I actually keep a food log just I write it down on a piece of paper, like what I ate amounts of a couple of days throughout the month. And I will put them in a tracker if I'm finding like I'm losing grip on losing a grip on something. And I'm like, I need to go back to square one and kind of see. And it's always so fun to kind of see like without even thinking about it. You know, I've been at this, uh, what is it, seven or eight years now, I have a pretty good handle on what a carbohydrate is, how much there is how much fat I need. Um, For example, at lunch today, I was eating my salad. And I'm like, I can already tell there's not enough fat in this, like just eating it. It doesn't taste right. I don't feel right. I I'm craving fat as I'm eating this, I didn't put enough fat in this meal. And so over time, you just become more and more and more intuitive. And if there are times where you're like, "Mm, did I screw up this last month, just keeping track of a couple things here and there. So you can be like, Oh, I see. Yeah, I definitely ate more carbohydrates that day. I ate less fat that day. Oh, I need to increase my protein, just kind of making those touch points. And Mm -hmm. knowing what your weakest links are, like, when I get stressed, I tend to eat less protein. <laughs> and yeah. just because it takes like it takes so long to make proteins. And so I'll find like I'll be eating more carbs and fats. Mm-hmm. And I'm blessed that my body doesn't really change that much. But I feel it a lot. Um, so I look at my tracker, and you know, like I'll write a couple of days and I'll be like, Oh, yeah, I'm definitely not eating enough protein. And that's my weak point. So I know when I'm stressed, I have to kind of like make a mental message of for myself, like, make proteins, prepare proteins, like get a bunch of stuff, um, cook it, put it in the fridge. So you have quick proteins, if it needs to be lunch meat, like go for it, you Mm -hmm. know, um, paleo Valley grass fed beef sticks, like just keep it all there. So when I'm going through a stressful period, I can grab the protein because that's my weakest link. Yours might be fat, somebody else might be not not moving enough. um, And just figuring out what your weakest link is. So when those things happen, you are prepared for it instead of sidetracked massively. (laughs) Yeah. Now with women, it usually is that protein component because I get in the same rut. I think even from way back in the day of competing and doing all that, there was Mm -hmm. so much protein that I kind of almost got away from it. Like, please don't show me another grilled chicken breast, please. (laughs) So I think, and and I find this in my patients too, that protein is the one thing that is really low. Do you find working with women that you kind of have to crack the whip and say, listen, you're not eating enough protein because we need to fuel your muscles that are metabolically active, that hair that you're complaining about that's dry and brittle and falling out, amino acids, protein, hello. Do you find that as well? Yeah, I find protein and vegetables like those two together. And with the protein piece, the the thing that always works when I'm explaining it to my clients is they take them through the liver detoxification pathway, because I think a lot of us don't realize how important amino acids, specifically glycine, taurine, and cysteine are for detoxification. And you know, you hear of like juice cleanses and detoxification that way. But if you don't have these amino acids, you're not going to poop well, and your gallbladder, like your bile is not going to be as high quality, you're not going to be able to get as much toxins out as you possibly can. And newsflash, if you're trying to lose weight, and you're burning that fat, and that fat is going to have toxins in it. And so it's really important to make sure that we're having enough protein in our diet so that we can um, make all those toxins water soluble, buddy them up and get them out of the body via the bile. Um, and ultimately the bowels uh, and your kidneys and ultimately your urine. So the amino acid piece is so, so important for the detoxification pathway and making sure that as we're adjusting things and you're losing weight on keto, that you're getting the toxins out properly. And then plants, I think is a big thing. Like people get stuck on celery and cucumber and celery and cucumber and celery and cucumber. And I'm like, how about shard or beet greens and arugula and mixed greens? And like, let's add in some, some color here instead of celery. Yeah. Don't be scared of a pepper. Don't be scared. (laughs) 
<laughs> you'll be okay. You'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Cut small slices. You'll be fine. But I think like the greens aspect and those bitter foods, um, I, I massively see lacking um, in most meal. Like I have my clients take pictures of yeah. their food so I can like see like where they're sitting, what the textures look like. Like I want to see how, how they're preparing their food. And a lot of it looks really brown and blah. Oh, so we work on the yeah. color aspect too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even just from a satiety point of view, having more color on your plate is going to make you think that you're eating a bigger quantity. And it really does trick your brain into thinking that you're, you're full. And obviously we mm -hmm. want you to eat until you are full. Just like you said, with the salad, you could tell you didn't have enough fat in it. You know, we want you to get to that point of, of being in tune with your body and not having to look at your plate, but it does help having variety and having color. Yes. I mean, even a simple thing um, like regular orange carrots versus rainbow carrots. I don't know. But when I'm eating rainbow carrots, I'm like, they're so beautiful. This is so awesome. <laughs> like, I just am happier eating rainbow carrots. And they're a very comparable price. And it's just better to look at um, and makes me feel healthy eating different colors. I'm like, this mm -hmm. isn't orange. It's yellow and white and um, purple. And this one's a little bit pink. And you can just have more fun with it. I think the color thing is missing in a lot of of plans that I look at for sure. Yeah, and I swear they taste differently too. It's they like totally do, flavors. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who we needs do. Skittles? <laughs> so, okay, we touched on all of that. I big, big question that I had in mind to bring to you today that I want you to answer. And I know you you just did a great interview with Don D'Agostino. So anyone that wants to listen to that, if you're the queen of keto, he's the king of keto. <laughs> um, and, and king and queen came together, had a great discussion. So that's on over on Leanne's podcast. But you did, you asked him about keto, um, exogenous ketones, keto esters, ketone salts. Can you talk about, because not everybody's going to jump over there. So can you talk here about what you're take is on utilizing things like beta hydroxybutyrate and exogenous ketones to kind of push someone out of a, out of a rut, help them through keto flu, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, originally I was very against all of this. Um, I spoke very clearly against, um, all of that, um, MCT oil, not so much, um, but more of the exogenous ketones. I really didn't feel like they had a place on the ketogenic diet. And then I went on my first book tour and I met quite a few ladies who said like, I wouldn't have been able to get over the hump of starting this new diet had I not had something to inspire me on how I would feel on a daily basis on my own on this diet, meaning that they were eating keto and they just weren't getting the results quick enough. And I mean, if you're eating a standard American diet and you go to keto, it is like a clean ketogenic protocol, like what both of us are promoting and sharing and eating ourselves. Like it's a big change and you're not feeling that great for the first couple of weeks. Even mm -hmm. if you do it correctly, that keto flu, even if you're doing electrolytes, even if you're trying your best, you might not feel good. And so speaking with these women and, and hearing that they were tr doing everything right and still not feeling optimal. Um, and when they added in the exogenous ketones, they started feeling better Then I was like, Oh, shoot. Yeah, I need to reassess that. <laughs> yeah. So um, I tried a whole bunch of them. There are some that I think are absolute garbage because mm -hmm. they have caffeine and yep. caffeine will make you feel very, very similar to how ketones will feel. It's so important that you make sure that the company knows how much uh, BHB is in their product. Some of them will be like, yeah, it's in there. And you're like, well, how much? It's in there. You know, yeah. so that's not helpful at all. So I think that it can definitely have a place when you're first getting started just to give you that like, oh, this is what life is like on the other side of the rainbow. Got it. Mm -hmm. Um, and another piece is if you've been keto for quite some time, I don't do this so much anymore, but when I was on tour or I was had speaking engagements and when I had back to back to back to back meetings, I was fueled with ketones, like exogenous yep. ketones that whole time because my brain, it's like I couldn't function without them when I was that busy. Mm -hmm. Do I use them on a daily basis now? I don't feel like I need them. But if I have some mental thing, like if I'm studying for a test mm -hmm. or if I have something where my brain just needs to be on point, um, yep. I will definitely use them. What about yeah. you? 
I, I love them. I fell in love with them a couple of years ago. Like you, I started researching and it's like, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. Looked into a couple of different companies. Like you said, they have caffeine in it and any, I don't know, any MLM. I'm just kind of mm, turned off. Uh, by. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. I know we're um, talking about the same product. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> <Probably>. we are. <laughs> we won't name names. <laughs> But no, I actually, I tried it because a friend of mine gave me some samples and I tried it and I had my, my keto mojo and I was testing my ketones. I tested before and I tested during, I tested a half an hour after, an hour after, and two hours after, just to kind of see, just to play around and see. And I did not see that much change with that product. Now I have tried some others since then. And there are, there's one in particular that I absolutely love that I keep on hand just like you, I'll use it during a long day. If I'm back to back with interviews, if I'm back to back with patients, um, if I have a speaking engagement, or if I just completely go off keto, like let's say it's Christmas and there's going to be two or three days of super high carb eating. I almost feel like it's like a, a little safety net. Like at least I'm tossing in some ketones <laughs> into the mix that maybe it'll help save me from going, you know, completely out of the water with with my glucose. So I'll use it yeah. then too. And probably help you maintain that feeling of like, oh, right, keto, when I go back on to it, this is how I'm going to feel. I know like through holidays and eating more, I'll depending on my adrenal status and what's going on with my adrenals, I'll like fast and then have mm -hmm. my ketones before the meal and my ketones after the meal and apple cider vinegar. And like, I'll do all the things to try to mitigate that. I'll ask if everyone wants to go for a walk after the big meal so we can like get our glucose levels a little bit lower. And so you, you, you have all these tools. And I yeah. think a lot of people don't feel like they have the tools. So they're like, ah, screw it. I'll start again in the new year or I'll start again on Monday. But it doesn't need to be like that. Have the yeah. thing, enjoy the thing. Um, but I think once you know how good keto feels and once you know how good just a healthy metabolism feels, if that becomes your center point, and I think exogenous ketones can help with that to like get you back to that center point of like, oh, right. This is how it feels. This is how great my brain feels. And I remember what life was like before keto. I mean, I was on, I had ADHD. I was a hot wreck mentally. And yeah. so that can kind of keep you focused too. If you deal with um, brain problems, like most of us do, um, those right. exogenous ketones um, can really, really, really help. Yeah. They can. And I think they push, especially people, like you said, starting with the standard American diet, moving into a keto diet slowly, but even slowly, you can still feel pretty crappy. And I also like throwing them in if someone has hit a plateau and it's really frustrating and almost to push them past that plateau. That's nice because you are technically increasing the ketones in the body, you're pushing yourself into a deeper state of fat burning, more out of the sugar burning, if you slip back into it for whatever reason, or like you mentioned earlier, lack of sleep, stress, cortisol, maybe your diet is perfect. And there's something else that is pushing you out of ketosis for whatever reason. Yeah, let's address that. And maybe throw in some exogenous ketones on top just to make you feel better as we're addressing everything else that needs to be addressed. Yes. And usually that thing that's underlying is stress. I would say like 90% of the time it's stress. And yeah. I mean, then you get into like liver function and estrogen dominance because yep. of the liver issues. But if, if all of a sudden you're dealing with cravings and you're not registering ketones and it's like this drop, what's happened over the last couple of days, that's totally stressed you out. And I mean, stress is completely perceived. So I mean, even mm -hmm. a, a split second where you couldn't find your kid at the festival and you're looking everywhere and you're like, where did they go? Where did they go? Is enough to complete, you kick, completely kick yourself out of ketosis and take yeah. a little bit of time to get back to that space. Like it's incredible how quickly it can happen. And, and generally speaking, it's usually stress related. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think people realize how much stress does to their body. They really oh. don't. They push it on the back burner all the time. I love talking stress and sleep with my guests because I don't mention it enough. So when someone does, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Stay on that. Yes. That's so important. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we discount it. Like I know myself, I do it. I'm like, I had a sort of bad sleep, but it shouldn't affect me this much. Yeah. But it's incredible. Like how much of an impact that these two things can have and how prevalent they are, you know, um, 
living the kind of life that I live where I'm working for two months and then not working for two months, I notice very quickly when I get back to work, I'm like, I was this stressed before. I'm not prepared for this. Like mm -hmm. we get so accustomed to the push, 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 push of daily life that we don't realize just how hard it is on our bodies and yeah. our ability to generate ketones and, and keep our glucose regulated. It's all related. And as a woman too, with fluctuating hormones all the time, I mean, stress is just going to hit you even harder. And like you mm -hmm. said, you noticed amenorrhea basically stopped, reversed when you did the keto diet. So that's how impactful eating can be on your hormones. Imagine how impactful stress is on your hormones. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely another piece of the pie. If nutrients and nutrition is 70% stress is at least 10 to 20 of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even some overlap. We'll even give it more. We'll take it up to 110% and give it stress. 30%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so last question for you, and it's one that I get quite often. What keto tracker do you recommend? What do you like for people to use? And do you, do you tell your clients to use it ongoing or just until they kind of reach the point of, of you and I were, okay, we're good. We're in tune with our body. It's cool. Yeah. So it depends on their goals. Um, for some clients, I recommend my symptoms. Um, and that's just, if they're dealing with like, I ate and then I was bloated and I had headaches and all this stuff is happening and they can't figure it out and I can't figure it out because their details are not detailed enough. I get them to use the My Symptoms app, which doesn't track actual macros and stuff like that. It just allows you to put in like what you ate and how you felt before and after. And I can see very quickly what the patterns are. And, you know, if they're getting a headache, every day around two o'clock, I'm looking at what their glucose is. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this headache is from a drop in glucose. And so we're adjusting that it just helps me figure out pretty quickly within the first two weeks, like, why are you having these symptoms? Is it food related? Um, and if it's not, or we figure it out, we'll move to usually carb manager, I I like it a little bit more than the other options. Um, it's easier as a practitioner to see the full day, whereas others, it's like I get screenshots of seven images yeah. in a day and I'm like, I can't <laughs> yeah. even, I don't even know what's happening here. Um, many of my clients use my fitness pal. I don't mind it. Um, uh, like yeah. I'm eh, on that. I'm with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> like, eh. um, but the carb manager I like. And then ultimately, if you're working with a practitioner, I, because I know macros. I can look at a meal and yeah. pretty much accurately guess within a couple of grams, like what's going on with that meal. Definitely. So I usually prefer my clients to take pictures and send them to me. That way I not only get to know what they're eating, but how they're eating it, the color of it, the plates that they're using. You know, sometimes, I mean, I have clients that use these ginormous plates and then they fill up the whole plate. And I'm like, Hey, do you have like a plate the size of your hand to spread yeah. out? Like, can you maybe put it on there or other clients who, you know, they're like, I had water with my meal and it's like literally half an inch in a cup. And I'm like, did you drink all the water before that picture or what's going on there? Right. Um, so it just helps me understand, um, just the full picture. So, um, if I had, to, if I had to, yeah, I guess they're all so different and it depends on where they're at. But those are kind of like the three strategies that I like to use in order to help my clients and kind of understand and also teach them, you know, this is what it should look like and maybe have this be a little bit different so that they're educated so that they can start to understand um, why I'm seeing what I'm seeing and why I'm recommending what I'm recommending because I'm not going to be around forever to help them um, right. boost up certain things and decrease certain things. Right. And the goal is to get them on their own anyways. So yeah. 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 Now what about something like a glucometer or keto mojo? Do you implement that with your clients? Oh, I'm so glad that you asked. Um, yes and no. Um, okay. I'm not like a huge, huge lover of the ketone testing situation. Like it depends on the client. Mm -hmm. I find if they're super geeky and type a, but they're willing to like let go of control, Generally, I'll recommend at least a continuous glucose monitor. I find for educating people as quickly as possible on how food is affecting them, yeah. the continuous glucose monitor is like king. Like it's 
when I was approached about continuous glucose monitor, I was like, why would I need that? That's so silly. It's not, that's not going to help me. And it was a game changer for me with, for my sleep and figuring out that my cortisol was, um, bumping up at nighttime and waking me up, um, to my glucose constantly being low. And I had like a low glucose problem that was causing a lot of my cravings and exhaustion. And yeah. so for my clients, I recommend a continuous glucose monitor if their doctor will approve of it, or they want to spend the money on it. It's not required, but I love using it on women who are just so incredibly fed up of feeling a certain way and they're ready to just like ditch the diet. But they're not as motivated as they could be. And so mm -hmm. you slap a CGM monitor on that arm and they're like, what? Oat milk does what? Oh yeah. my gosh, I'm never eating oat milk ever again. Mm -hmm. So I find for pattern changing quickly, a CGM is helpful. Whereas the ketones, I just don't feel like it has the same urgency. Um, and my, my goal as a coach is to take you from like zero to 60 in as least amount of seconds as possible right. and to get you seeing like what is happening inside your body. And I find the CGM is like the best tool for that. Otherwise, I really like the Biosense Keto ketone monitor rather um, that's breath mm -hmm. um, because you don't have to be poking your finger and all the things. I think that's like so the year 2000. Um, so I don't really recommend the keto mojo and stuff because it's just ugh, all the blood and the pin pricking and it's just a pain. But yeah, um, what are your thoughts on it? Love CGM. I, I want yeah. one. I want one so badly. So just a patient just last week said that she did a CGM. I think she rented one. I think you can rent them. Um, what? yeah, okay. she's like, I, I, I paid X amount. It wasn't bad. I went 179, 279. And she's like, I have it for six weeks and I'm thinking of renewing. And I'm like, Did you, are you renting it? Like, is this like, so I, I don't know. I have to get more, more details on that, but, um, she loves it. And she found just like you said earlier that Stevia jacks up her oh. glucose. So there you go. I mean, how often do we use Stevia? in keto recipes, like all the time, erythritol, monk fruit, all those sweeteners can affect your glucose, even though, I mean, the, the artificial sweeteners are total no-go. No, no, yeah. no, no. That's going to just destroy your body and jack up your insulin. But the, the safe ones that we do recommend in some people, it can really screw them up. So it's good yes, to know completely. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I found out I couldn't do stevia. That's how I found out I could eat oranges. Like I can eat oranges and it does nothing to my glucose. Like yeah. this changed my life. Like nice. it changed, changed my life. So even just wearing it for, um, yeah, they have different programs where you get like a little sensor, you put it in your arm, it lasts 14 days. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually they have programs for like four or six weeks. Um, and that gives you pretty good data. I do have friends that wear it all the time just cause they're total geeks, yeah. but that's ridiculously expensive. But I like to do like two week intervals. Like I'll wear it for two weeks. I'll take it off for three months. I'll put another one on for two weeks, take it off for three months. Um, just to kind of do those touch the touch points, um, yeah. and just continue to learning. But once, once you get that down and you understand your food combinations, how much protein you need to how much fat, I mean, it's, it doesn't really change all that much. And being able to have things like oranges, uh, I cannot have blackberries and on keto, blackberries are fine. They jack up my glucose. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, so, but strawberry is totally fine. And so a ketone monitor won't really give you that as much, but the no. glucose monitor, it's like instant gratification and understanding what your thoughts are doing to your glucose, what the stress is doing, what the sleep is doing, what the food is doing. Oh, that's my favorite thing. I want one now. Where did you <laughs> get you? <laughs> um, I use Levels. Yeah, um, okay. That's what I, 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 I really love hearing. their app. You know, there's there are other options, but um, when the person, when one of the people or many of the people on the team are like Harvard doctors and NASA yeah. scientists, I'm like, that's eh, probably pretty good. And they have a database, and they're always adding to it, so you can like discover which foods might be sensitive to you, which ones won't. And I just I love their tracking and stuff. So I use Levels. Um, it is quite expensive, but I mean, the amount of time and energy that I've saved wearing this for a couple of weeks is like, it's totally worth it. So That's I'm excited awesome. to hear if you get one and give it a whirl and learn about things. Yeah. You know, the only thing holding me back is if that thing shows the dark chocolate jacks me up, I'll be pissed. <gasps> I'll be pissed <Yep>. off. <laughs>
I could see that. Yep. Yep. I could see that. Just add nut butter. I'm sure it'll be fine. There you go. There you go. (laughs) Easy breezy. Well, Leanne, thank you so much for coming on and sharing just all of this information, just all of the wisdom. I love it when other people hear the same thing that I say, but from somebody else, it drives the point home. I love it, love it, love it. So tell people a little bit about, I know you have something starting today that they cannot enter, but you're going to be rolling that out again. So tell people about your programs and how they can connect with you. Yeah. So I've been in in the game for a while. So I have a lot of ways that you can connect with me Mm -hmm. and products and services and all the things. Um, Six week keto weight loss is kind of the program that I'm spending the most time on right now. It takes women uh, who are interested in hormone regulation while losing weight. Um, so the program just launched today. Again, it's maybe our third or fourth group coaching program. So I take a hundred women through the program over six weeks with group coaching calls and the whole bit. Um, mm-hmm. so if you go to healthfulpursuit.com slash six week, um, you can add yourself onto the wait list there. Then I have a 12 week program called happy keto body. And that's like, if you really want to delve into what's going on with your body and how I partnered with my best friend, um, Dr. Nina, who's a doctor and really good at her job to kind of go through more of the medical pieces. And we both educate on nutrition Mm -hmm. and medical pieces. So she can talk more diagnostically and I can talk more subclinically. So that was really fun. And then I have three paperback books, um, the keto diet, keto diet cookbook, keto for women. You can find those on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any bookstore. Um, and yeah, my website is healthfulpursuit.com and my podcast is the Keto Diet Podcast. Yeah. And I'm on Instagram, Leanne Vogel. So I have like, I'm in a lot You're of places. Everywhere. Just search Leanne <laughs> Keto. We'll, we'll put all the links. All the links will be in the podcast show notes. So no worries there, but I still like you to tell everybody. <laughs> I love it. Dr. Amy, thank you so much for having me on today. This is just such a blast. It's so great to connect with like-minded individuals who aren't crazy about keto and just want to use it to support their bodies. And it's really cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. We need more people. We need more people in the space and giving this message to women. So, so thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. And I'm sure we'll have you back on. Would love to.